Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of the Village Square. On behalf of the Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us tonight for our declaration, an evening with Danielle Allen. This program begins a multi-year series of digital programs, Unum, Democracy Reignited, presented in partnership with Florida Humanities. The programs will explore the past, present, and future of the American idea as it exists on paper, in the hearts of our people, and as it manifests in our lives. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome streaming partners from USC Center for the Political Future, Center for the Humanities at University of Miami, Common Ground Committee, Citizen Connect, the Tallahassee Democrat, and WFSU. We will put links to purchase Dr. Allen's book, Our Declaration, in the chat window. If you're in Tallahassee and you buy your book at Midtown Reader, mention the Village Square and you'll get 15% off. You may ask questions tonight at any time during the program by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Some of you may already know that Dr. Allen is running for governor of Massachusetts. We wanted to clarify that our topic tonight is focused on Do Dr. Allen's scholarship and that we won't pass along political questions to her. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator, Dr. Nasheed Majuan, Executive Director of Florida Humanities. Dr. Majuan's extensive professional career in the humanities includes his past leadership at the James Eaton Senior Southeastern Regional Black Archives at Florida A&M University and the Art Museum and Archives at Hampton University. Dr. Majuan has served as the, on many boards, including the Blues Foundation, the Austin Arts Council, Arkansas Black History Commission, Virginia State Heritage Preservation Board, Visit Florida, and the African American History Task Force for the state of Florida. Dr. Majuan, over to you. Thanks, Liz. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Danielle Allen. The James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University, a political theorist who has written broadly about democratic theory and the history of political thought, troubled by the fact that so few Americans know what the Declaration of Independence says, Dr. Allen set out to explore the arguments of the Declaration reading it with both adult night students and University of Chicago undergraduates. In our declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in defense of equality, keenly aware that the declaration is riddled with contradictions, liberating some while subjugating slaves and Native Americans, Allen and her students nonetheless came to see that the declaration makes a coherent and riveting argument about equality. Dr. Allen's other books include Cuz, the Life and Times of Michael A, and the forthcoming democracy in the time of coronavirus. She is also the principal investigator for the Democratic Knowledge Project at Harvard University, a chair of the Commission on the Practice of De Democratic Citizenship, past chair of the Pul Pul Pulitzer Prize and Mellon Foundation Boards, and a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Dr. Allen, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Madrin, for the generous introduction and both to you and to Liz for hosting this terrific series. What an amazing partnership and collaboration. And I just think it's so important in these days when we've all been so separated from one another that we find partnerships that take as our focus the project of bringing us back together again. So it's a real honor to be a part of this conversation and to help you kick off this series. I am gonna talk about the Declaration of Independence tonight, but I'm gonna start in a slightly different place which is just to say and to acknowledge that I think we all feel that this is a time of immense stress and strain in our national life. It's clearly the case because of the pandemic. It's been a very hard time for everybody. Not a soul has been untouched, though some have been touched much more worse, much worse than others, for sure. But we feel the stress and strain. We feel it in so many different dimensions. And we also feel our division from one another. I think that's a pretty common feature of our experience these days. And so one of the things I like to do, and I have a sort of dream of a project where what we would do together is actually just all stop and take a moment and ask the question, I know I love my country. What does my love of country come from? What are the sources of my love of country? 
So I want to give each of you that question to take with you tonight. And I hope after this event, you'll ruminate on that. What are the sources of your love of country? Because tonight I'm going to share with you the sources of my love of country, some of the things that really capture my heart and connect me to the sense of what's possible for America. The Declaration of Independence is one of those sources of love of country for me. So what I want to do tonight is share with you what it is about the Declaration of Independence that so inspires me. And then after I've shared that, I'm gonna take a moment to pause and think about all the reasons we might have to be skeptical about the Declaration of Independence. Very many of us are skeptical about the Declaration of Independence. And then I'll take a minute to think as well about why are we skeptical even about perhaps the idea of love of country because many are also skeptical of the idea of love of country. So my hope in the end will be to have revived for you the idea that love of country is something accessible to all of us and that we can make sense of it even with the complexities of our history and the challenges of the things that cause us such deep concern. So in order to explain to you why I love the Declaration of Independence so deeply, I have to go ahead and recite to you the all important second sentence. That's where I always have to start. So let me just ask you to settle in and listen for a moment. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principle and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now be honest, did you remember the sentence was that long? Many people think it stops right after the very beginning when we hear about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in fact, the sentence is that long. Jefferson wrote it as one sentence. John Adams copied it down as one sentence like that. Congress's secretary, the Secretary of Continental Congress wrote it into the minute book that way in that length. And it's one sentence because it's a single argument. It's an argument that philosophers would call a syllogism. It's got a couple of premises and they add up to a conclusion that is the logically necessary conclusion. And the basic idea of the sentence is human beings have some, we're all equal. We're equal in the regard to the fact that we have these rights that we are created with and that we get some examples, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are just examples, you know, among which rights the declaration says we have these. So first we know we have rights. Then the second part of the sentence says, well, we build political institutions together in order to secure these rights. And then that leads to a conclusion that if the things we've built together are actually destructive, they're they're not supporting those rights, then we have the right to alter or to abolish it. Okay, and so that's the idea of the sentence. It is capturing the theory of revolution, the right of revolution that inspired the American revolution in the first place. But then what the sentence really does is land consequentially and with profound insight and moral clarity on the core responsibility of citizenship. All right, now let me just give you the end of the sentence again so you can hear it. Whenever any government becomes destructive of these ends of securing our rights, it is the right of the people, of us, to alter or to abolish it even and to lay the foundation for new government on such principle and to organize its power in such form as to to them, to us, shall seem most likely to affect our safety and happiness. That final end of the sentence is the meat of the Declaration of Independence. And it is what I believe is fundamentally necessary for us today. It's what I love about the Declaration of Independence. It tells us what our job is as citizens. It is to diagnose, to look around, to ask, are our institutions securing our rights. And if they're not, then how do we alter them? It's a project of alteration, I think, that it really teaches us to think about. And the job of alteration, that last clause says, has two parts. First, we've got to lay a foundation on principle. We have to be clear about the values that are going to orient us, the ethical commitments that are going to define us as a people that are going to help us understand what it is we are trying to build together. And then we have to organize the powers of government in such a form as to deliver on those principles. It was always those two prongs, the foundation and principle, and then organizing the powers of government. Now, what on earth does it mean to think about organizing the powers of government? 
Well, that's a very technical idea. And it means just very basically that you set up the rules and procedures, the operating manual for how to make decisions together. In May of 1776, June of 1776, as the members of Continental Congress were beginning to get really clear that the moment for revolution had arrived, they developed a set of jobs that they thought they had to do. And they were exactly these two jobs, to lay a foundation in principle and then to organize the powers of government so that they could make decisions together effectively. In order to lay the foundation of principle for their revolution and for the new society they were gonna build, they drafted the Declaration of Independence. It was a preamble to their decision to declare independence. But at the same time, exactly the same time that they did that, as they set up a committee to draft the declaration, they also set up a committee to draft the Articles of Confederation. That was the instrument that we, that's the technical word, the legal tool, the document that was going to explain how Congress was gonna operate and how all the newly formed states now, not colonies, were gonna share decisions together. So those two things together, the Declaration and the Articles of Confederation were the foundation and principle on the one hand, and then the instruction manual, the operating manual, the rules of procedure for how to organize the powers of government. Then of course, after the revolution, quickly nothing worked, that the Articles of Confederation didn't work, the operating manual was breaking, nobody could steer the thing, they couldn't drive the machinery of government, they couldn't make a budget, people weren't coming to Congress, they didn't have a quorum, they couldn't pass decisions. The whole thing wasn't, wasn't working at all. And that's what led us to the Constitutional Convention. So at the Constitutional Convention, they had a debate, they asked themselves, do we need to write a new document of principle? Do we need to relay the foundation of principle? Or do we just need to reorganize the powers of government? And they decided they didn't need to relay the foundation of principle that the declaration already captured those core principles, those principles of equality and liberty. That was the core already. They were clear on that. So they did the work of reorganizing the powers of government by reorganizing the operating manual. And we got the constitution as a result of that. Now, but if you listen closely to that declaration and hear what the foundation of principle tells you, right, it tells you that it's our job, again, to diagnose, is our government securing our rights, and then to make a judgment about whether we need alterations. The Constitution itself reflected a commitment to the notion that the people judges over and over again whether or not it's achieving its goals. So in that regard, what was created in the very beginning was a an approach that was always about perpetual review and perpetual improvement. There was no expectation of permanence, actually, even for the Constitution. Durability, yes. That it would last and be flexible and adaptable and work, yes. But permanence, no. The expectation was that the people would have to judge over and over and over again. Now, why do I love this? Why is this so inspiring to me? For starters, because it's empowering. Okay, it is empowering of us, of us in 2021, we the people, we still have the same job of judgment that they had in 1776, that they had in 1787. So that's the first reason I love it. The second reason I love that sentence is because it makes clear we're, oh, we're all created equal. We are equal in being people who can help shape that understanding of our collective shared purpose, our core values, and we can help shape the question of how we organize the rules of procedure to work together, all right? So that we're equal precisely in wanting and desiring freedom and learning that we can exercise it through shared self-governance. Equality and freedom fit together mutually like hand in glove. The job, the point is freedom for all, but we can't have freedom for all unless we have freedom from domination by one another. And that means we have to share together in the tools and practices of self-government. So that's the second reason I love that sentence because it puts equality and liberty together in that really profound way. And then the third reason I love it is because it conveys on us a sense of responsibility. It really is our job and it's our job collectively. So I wanna to come to that point now, finally. Lots of times when we think about the declaration and we only think about that first sentence or the, not the first sentence, rather the first clause and we just think about the idea that we are all created equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if we stop our thinking there, our focus is exclusively on individual rights. You know, wow, I'm gonna pursue my happiness. I, what, how am I gonna do that? That's my job, it's not anybody else's business. It's just about my happiness. But when you focus on the whole sentence, you realize that again, it starts from that statement that we all are the same. We share, we're equal in having these individual rights. But then to protect those rights, 
It's explicit. It says governments are instituted among men to secure those rights. We build something together to protect our rights. And what is the thing that we build? It's our political institutions. And what's their overarching purpose? That's what we get at the very end again, when it says, you know, it's our job to alter them if need be in such a way as seems to us most likely to affect our safety and happiness. Go back and look at the text after this and look at that our safety and happiness at the end of that sentence. It is about what we do together, okay? So yes, we have individual rights, but our job is to build the institutions of government so that together we can, we can achieve our shared safety and happiness. Now this phrase, safety and happiness, is a really, really important phrase. It is an 18th century translation of a Roman phrase that defined political philosophy for centuries. Now, the Roman phrase was salus populi suprema lex esto. Let the health of the people, salus populi, the health of the people, let the health of the people be the supreme law. What did this Roman phrase mean? It was coined by Cicero, great Roman statesman in the Roman Republic. What did that phrase mean? It meant that when you're making a judgment about what the purpose of politics is, there's only one answer, the health and well-being of the people. Is the people prospering? Imagine you're a farmer and you have an apple orchard. The question is, are your apple orchard trees growing and bearing fruit? You can tell the difference between a thriving orchard and an orchard that's withering. The same is true with a people. Are we thriving? Are we healthy? Are we growing as a people? Are we living to our full maturity? And when we're not, then something's wrong with our politics. Now we all know something's wrong with our politics. But what I want to suggest is that in order to fix what's wrong with our politics, we actually do have to come back to this question of what we love about our country in the first place. And just try to have conversations with one another where we say, hey, I love my country. I believe you love your country too. Why do you love your country? Let me tell you why I love my country. We're going to have different answers to that question. But I think if we could just start by returning to a point of putting back on the table for each other why we love our country, we might, we just might have the starting point for a conversation together. So that's why I love my country because at its origins, it has this charge, this call and exhortation to all of us to understand our own power, to be empowered, to be judges, to be decision makers, to help shape the world that we live in together to achieve our shared safety and happiness. That's one of the reasons I love my country. But let me now spend some time with the skeptics and the reasons to be skeptical about the Declaration of Independence. And there are a couple of concerns people have immediately. Didn't Jefferson draft the Declaration? Wasn't he a slaveholder? How can we celebrate a document that talks about equality when it was written by a slaveholder? And what about women? You know, where are women when you talk about, you know, all men are created equal? What's happened to women in the Declaration of Independence? These are really important questions and they're deep and profound. They go to the heart of our challenges, but there's some really important things to recognize about the Declaration. So for starters, Thomas Jefferson was just actually one of many people who authored the Declaration. There was a committee of five people. Jefferson was the chair of it. I won't go into the process for how he ended up as chair, but suffice it to say the other members were John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston, four Northerners and one Southerner. Among those four Northerners, two by the time of the Declaration, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, were already committed to abolition, to ending enslavement. And their voices are in the Declaration too. In fact, that sentence I quoted, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that moment in the Declaration is an anti-slavery moment. They locked the phrase life, liberty, and property, which was the more common phrase, and claims about a right to property were already in 1776 being used to defend enslavement as a right. Franklin and Adams blocked that language from the Declaration. They gave us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And because they did that, it was possible as early as 1777 for Prince Hall, a free African-American in Boston, Massachusetts, to draw on the language of the Declaration of Independence and put a petition forward to the Massachusetts Assembly arguing for an end to enslavement in Massachusetts. And indeed, that same language in the Declaration made its way into the Massachusetts Constitution, which John Adams drafted. And in the Massachusetts Constitution, it became the basis in Massachusetts for the end of enslavement in 1783, before the Revolutionary War was even over, okay? So one state in the Union, Massachusetts, ended slavery 
even before the American Revolution was over. So we have to recognize that when this country started, it had multiple voices in it already. It did have pro-enslavement voices like Thomas Jefferson, like Virginia, the state of Virginia at the time was defending enslavement, but it also had abolitionist voices, anti-enslavement voices, Massachusetts, John Adams, Ben Franklin, Pennsylvania followed suit behind Massachusetts very quickly. They too had emancipation underway by the early 1780s, all right? So that's a really important thing to recognize about the declaration that it has abolitionism in it. It speaks for and spoke to abolitionists right from the very, very beginning. It is not a story merely of slaveholders. So those of us who recognize and respect the tradition of abolition should be elevating the Declaration of Independence. It belongs to us. It belongs to the project of abolitionism in this country. Now, what about women? Now, here is a really deep point that was made best by Abigail Adams. Several people raised the question of what happened. You know, what about women? What about women's rights? Abigail Adams raised questions about the place of women in the New Republic in writing to her husband, John Adams, as the war was developing. She was very eager to see the war come. She thought they were moving too slowly. She wanted to them to move along more rapidly. And so she wrote to John and said, well, what, about, what about us? You know, men have this habit over history of exercising tyrannical power over their wives. This is not okay. And John wrote back to her and he wrote back to some other people who also wrote to ask questions about the place of poor people, working people without property and about the place of, in the language of the time, Negroes in the new arrangements. And he gave roughly the same answer to Abigail and to the others who wrote to him. And it's an interesting answer and it's wrong, but it's an important one for understanding what happened at that period in time. He said, look, the, the basic principles, the goals here, the protection of liberties, the protection of rights, that's for everybody. You know, we're trying to build something that is trying to provide that foundation of safety for everybody. But he said, the power, the question of how the power will be exercised, he said, for that, we're going to rely on our masculine system of power. In other words, he took that distinction between laying a foundation on principle and how we organize the powers of government and use that to justify a patriarchal approach to our government at that early point. In other words, he was saying, our foundation of principle, our rights, the fact that every human being has these basic natural rights, that foundation of principle, that includes everybody, it includes women, it includes poor people, it includes people of color, it includes everybody. But he said, the question of how we organize power, that, and his phrase was masculine system, we're going to have a masculine system. And he thought that power should be exercised by men who owned property. Now, this is where he made his fundamental mistake, and Abigail called him on it at the time. She said, you know, look, basically, again, men have had a history of abusing their power, and it seems quite likely that if power is concentrated in this way, again, it'll be abused. And if it's abused, then we women, she said, will have to foment a revolution for voice and representation. And indeed, that's what happened. The fundamental point Abigail was articulating is that you cannot actually protect everybody unless you put power in their hands to protect themselves. Never in human history has it worked for one group of people to protect another group of people without that first group who holds the power coming to abuse it. You know, absolute power corrupts. This is something that we learn over and over again in history. And Abigail called that early on. And as a result, history played out as she predicted, women had to foment for voice and representation, foment a rebellion for voice and representation. And in various ways for the rest of our history, we've been working to reorganize the powers of government to ensure that power really is available to all, that all can participate in decision-making so that all can protect themselves in relationship to those basic rights. So lots more to be said about the declaration, lots more to be said about how it can give us lessons and guidance in the present as we try to solve our own problems. Um, but the last thing I want to say then is about love of country again, because another thing people will often say to me when I share that I love the Declaration of Independence and love my country, they'll say, well, but what about all the things that are wrong with our country? You know, what about the fact, Danielle, that you've lost family members to mass incarceration? What about the fact that you have family members who are struggling with poverty day in and day out? What about that, Danielle? How can you love your country when you can also see the places where we have failed so completely. And what I always say to that, and what I say to people who say, well, I don't feel love of country, I feel angry at my country. I say, you know, the truth is, I feel really angry sometimes at the people I love the most, at my parents, at my brother, at my husband, at my kids. 
love and anger go together. It's a hard thing, but it's the truth. And when we feel anger inside a relationship of love, we know what our job is. We know our job is to take a step back, to breathe, to try to name the source and cause of our anger, and to turn it into a problem that we can make meaning around and then find solutions to together, but always holding on to that bond of love. So that's the really important thing I hope that you'll take away is that we can have love of country and be angry at our country at the same time. But in order to deal with the anger element, we've got to really focus on the love part and recommit to that and understand that it is the resource we need for solving the problems that are provoking the anger. So again, to conclude, before we turn over to our Q&A and our discussion, I do hope after this event, you'll just take a moment to reflect and ask yourself the question, what is it about my country that I love the most? Find that that thing you love, the different things you love, hold on to it in your heart and then share it with somebody. That's what I would ask. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you. That was riveting, um, engaging, and there's a lot to unpack there. And I like the way you ended um, your talk in that there's a lot, there are a lot of individuals and uh, people that we need to examine and it starts with us, you know, our values. Um, but one of the tricky questions of this year actually is uh, January 6th. And in the Declaration of Independence, you mentioned the ability to people to, you know, to abolish a government that's not working for them. Now, whether they're led poorly or led properly, it is within their right if, to seek change um, if they're, they're not represented properly. And we're in a democratic republic, not necessarily a democracy. Uh, what are your views on um, the ability to abolish or change a government? So there are a few important things to say. <clears throat> One is to recognize that to have a revolutionary founding is a hard thing for any society in the sense that a core goal for any society is to achieve stability and durability. You wanna last, you wanna grow, you wanna prosper. And so by definition, once you've come to exist, then revolution is not necessarily the first thing you wanna see happen again, right? Uh, so even yeah, you started yeah. in a revolution, yeah. it's not what you want. Exactly. So, but the declaration is also really explicit about that challenge, right? I mean, the immediate next sentence after the alter and abolish clause is that government should not be changed for light and transient causes. And then they go into a process of describing the 10 years that they took to pursue through procedural mechanisms, a change from the British government. So that is always for me, the guide. The question is, do you have operating procedures that are appropriately litigating the issue and helping to achieve solutions? And the simple fact of the matter is that we do, that we do. And so those who judged otherwise for January 6th made a mistake, they were wrong. We had court processes that worked their way through November and December, litigating what had happened with the election, clarifying it, and coming to a very clear conclusion that the election had been soundly administered across the whole of the country. So that work was done. So there was not a reasonable basis for a revolutionary action um, of any kind in January. That's the critical thing. And I think that is really what the framework of the declaration also helps make clear. Yeah, and so uh, you, you also mentioned. Prince Hall, African Americans and um, mass incarceration um, here in Florida. Uh, we've addressed and tackled and readdressed the issue of uh, post incarceration rights. And, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, how do we address that? You know, people have rights, inalienable, as you mentioned, and the pursuit of happiness, and you are paying taxes. You know, you're not alleviated from that responsibility. You're not alleviated from following laws. You're rehabilitate, rehabilitated, so to speak, right? You know, all of these principles we get out of uh, punishment as you examined in your dissertation, which is remarkable. And, and um, but now we have a large sweeping population of individuals who are contributing to society in other ways, but not properly represented, you know, the, meaning in a re democratic republic, 
you vote for representation mm -hmm. and that person carries the water for you because you have other things to do, so to speak. But how do we address that? Well, you know, it was really encouraging to see the ballot proposition in Florida in 2018 to restore voting rights to people who had completed their felony convictions. Yeah. And I know that then the further events in Florida have undermined that ballot proposition. So, you know, I think recovering the work uh, that was done to move that ballot proposition forward and uh, reinvesting in it, recommitting to it is really critical. Um, I did co-chair uh, for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a commission mm -hmm on the future of the practice of democratic citizenship. We worked over several years. We conducted listening sessions all over the country. We were a bipartisan commission and we worked really hard to find a set of recommendations for improving and strengthening our democracy that really could gain assent and affirmation across political lines of division. And, and so our report called Our Common Purpose came out in June, 2020. And I would really encourage everybody to take a look at it because I think it does offer a blueprint for how we can restore sort of virtuous cycle linking responsive political institutions to the empowerment um, of ordinary people to a civic culture that supports our sense of shared commitment to each other and to our country. In that report, we have 31 recommendations and one of them is indeed that we should be restoring voting rights to people who have completed their felony convictions. So the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a long standing <laughs> ancient of days academic oh. institution um, has in the course of its work and again, engaging with people in all kinds of contexts and places, um, come to the view that this is really one of the most important things that we need to move forward. So we would commend that report to everybody's attention. The Academy has also been building out a network of organizations who are champions of different recommendations in the report. And so for those of you in this audience um, who are involved in trying to restore voting rights to people who have completed their felony convictions, I would encourage you to reach out to the Academy um, and get connected with the champion um, organizations that are working on moving that forward. I think it's really important. Yeah, yeah that's, that's some good work. It's a heavy lift for some. Um, you know, we were still going back and forth with it in Florida, but it opened the door for a discussion across the United States and the territories. It did. And if you don't mind my jumping in for a second there, no, no, fine, yeah. I just want to say it was so important about it. And maybe I'll say something to you about the dissertation and some of the history, but please, um, yeah, please. But that your the ballot proposition was so important because it was a supermajority vote, right? That's right. We yeah. believe, you know, we've come to think in this country that we're so divided from one another. Yet if you look around the country, we can find all kinds of ballot propositions that we actually voted on with super majorities. So more than 66% of the people supporting it. And that means people from both parties. And I believe if we take that list of ballot propositions that have super majority votes and focus on them, we'll actually find a starting point for re rebuilding a sense of common purpose. So restoring voting rights for people who've completed their felony convictions is one example. Right. In Mississippi, Amazingly, you know, with a supermajority vote, they voted in a new state flag that had gotten rid of Confederate emblems. That's a huge thing to say that, you know, you, that was possible with a supermajority vote. Um, also, cannabis legalization in several states has been achieved with supermajorities. Um, in Massachusetts, we had a supermajority around the right to repair of small auto shops having rights so that they're not sort of trapped out of or locked out of doing repairs because of the right. data require, you know, control that big companies have. So sort of orientation towards small business. So the point is just that, you know, again, you know, with, with that work in Florida, it was a good example of a place that we are actually able to come together. And I think we had to find those and really try to build on yeah. that. But I said, I was gonna say something about history too. Can I take one more minute to- No, go ahead, keep the <laughs> history. That's fine. You, you mentioned my, my dissertation, my, yeah, I enjoyed my it, original- yeah dissertation on punishment in ancient Athens of all things. Yeah, mm -hmm. So punishment as practiced by a democracy 2,500 years ago. And there's one really fundamental difference between punishment in antiquity and punishment now that we don't actually get our heads around often enough. This is the simple fact that in antiquity, one of the most common punishments they used was exile. And that sounds harsh in many ways. In many ways it was that people would have to leave their communities forever but the one thing that was positive about exile was that people could go someplace else and start anew. They could build wow. a new life. They got a second chance. Yeah. The world used exile 
to give people a second chance until the middle of the 19th century. So literally it wasn't until the 1850s and 1860s when the world got fully carved up into nation states, that's when the use of exile ended. And I think we have to really focus on that idea because what it means is that for all of human history until just like 150 years ago, people believed in second chances. People believed that people should be able to set up a, a new yeah. life completely, have a family, get a job, be a part of a community. Exactly. So I think that it's just imperative for us at the level of our core human morality to recognize that we need to figure out how to make sure that whatever system of punishment we have is a for real second chance system. And we do not have a second chance system right now. All right. And, and, and but now the supermajority point you made uh, and the conflict between states and the federal government mm -hmm. is an issue with the cannabis piece. So now you have a supermajority. People exercise their right to change something they feel is wrong and they win. It's on the books, right? The Declaration of Independence is a federal mechanism. So there's, a, there's, there's an inherent conflict because states' rights versus federal obligation and the social contract. You know, we're trying to find a way to pursue our happiness and our liberty. But how do we reconcile that? So, I mean, first we have to ask, ask exactly the question you just answered, which is um, how do we reconcile? The beauty of your question is that you're starting from the idea that we should reconcile these things, that we mm. should harmonize them. And in asking that question, you're asking exactly the same question that the founders asked. So over the last 25 years or so, we've acquired the idea that what federalism amounts to is just letting every state do whatever it wants. That so just sort of like, it is a pure, you know, this state does that, this another state does this other thing, and you know, that's what federalism is. That is not actually what federalism was originally conceived to be. Now, let's just start with the word. The word federalism comes from the Latin word for a treaty, which comes itself from the Latin word for, for faith or bond. The entire point of federalism is that you're actually knitting together. It's not about just going your own way. And this was so much so that you know, in the period between the revolution and the constitution. And so I mentioned some of this in my remarks. I mean, what happened was um, they did not have a fun functioning finance system and they didn't have a functioning national fiscal system. So yes, that's right. Yeah. national government couldn't pay its debts, mm -hmm. couldn't get states to contribute to national coffers to pay off war debts, couldn't pay soldiers. This starts to generate tension, Jay's right. rebellion, for example. So the whole thing is not working because it's not possible to harmonize interests. I mean, just exactly as you said, right? Like things couldn't, felt like they couldn't be reconciled. It was the fact that they weren't able to reconcile things that the operations were breaking that led to the Constitutional Convention. And so the entire goal of the Constitutional Convention was to reorganize relationships among states and the federal government in order to achieve harmonization. That is literally the word that is used in the Federalist Papers to describe oh, what the mm -hmm. point is of federalism. It's to harmonize so that the interests of the states and the national, the shared national interests can be harmonized. These things can work in sync with each other. And so I think one of our greatest challenges right now, honestly, is that we have lost an understanding of what the core purpose of federalism is. It's actually harmonization yeah. in alignment with the national interest with flexibility and adaptability, so there can be variation, but nonetheless, that harmonization is the core goal. Right. And then just as we've lost our understanding of the purpose, I think we've also lost our understanding of how to actually activate the machinery of federalism in support of a harmonized effort. So I think we have a lot of relearning to do on that front. Yeah, so you, you, in looking at harmony um, and the ability to change a system that's broken, you know, federalism uh, addressed its financial challenges and we of course we have challenges today but <clears throat> looking at the timing 250 years of this declaration of independence and it took a century to address slavery and it took two centuries with the 19th amendment to address gender equality so to speak well voting rights you know we still have <clears throat> some inequality with pay maybe there's some way to address that and now we're starting to see abuse with the electoral college and representation. Um, do you see on the horizon any amendments that you think that we should be looking at? 
Well, let me just come back again to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences report, um, Our Common Purpose. Um, so when we did this work, so there was about 35 people on this commission from a variety of professional sectors, all demographic backgrounds, geographic backgrounds across the country, and as I mentioned, um, bipartisan, cross-partisan. And we knew, we, we started because we all had a sense that things are, you know, kind of in rough shape. For me, <laughs> my kind of red alert moment came back in 2013 when Congress had an approval rating of 9%. I was like, if Congress has an approval rating of 9%, then that means the people doesn't approve of its own voice. Right. And then if you, your democracy is broken, if that's the situation. So we all had our different reasons for thinking that things are in a bad state. And we came together to find solutions and we knew we wanted solutions that were bold, but also feasible. And so as we thought about our recommendations, we really wanted to make sure that we were trying to figure out what lever to pull that was would give you the maximal impact, would get you where you needed to go, but was also feasible to pull. And as a result of that, um, we ended up with only one constitutional amendment that we wanted yeah. to recommend. So everything else that we recommended, we recommended as changes that could be done and through Congress or through states or through municipalities and the like, or through civil society organizations. And the single amendment um, that we recommended um, is a, a, an amendment to, to change the impact of Citizens United. Um, and the impact of money in politics to, um, to end the idea that corporations have the same kind of speech rights as individual people. That was the single thing that we recommended we should pursue as a constitutional amendment. Yeah, so the amount of money that can be spent to influence politics is one thing, but it looks at your right. I mean, is your wealth, there's a conflict there. You know, you amass a measure of wealth and you have responsibilities to, you know, address that or maintain it or influence or however you have the means to do so. And of course, you have stratification. You have those who don't have the means. But, you know, that's another reconciling point and but an inherent conflict. So the influence of money in, cap in campaigns, how do we address that? So just, I mean, to... to to break it up into a couple of different issues. So the yeah. amendment that we're focused on in response to Citizens United is specifically about ending um, the role of corporate money. So the money, you know, the, where corporations act or the whole company um, acts to uh, fund uh, political enterprises. And so what happened in Citizens United is that the Supreme Court ruled that corporations, you know, Chevron or Mo Exxon Mobil or Apple right. um, have our persons in the same way that Danielle's a person, in the same way that Nasheed's a person and the like. And that is really, I think, you know, it's a fundamental change of understanding of what a person is. Um, and that's where the real problem comes in. Um, so in that regard, uh, the amendment that we are recommending um, leaves open the okay. sort of individual role, which mm -hmm. does mean that people with more money ha have access to more participation, but here there are other kinds of tools that we also could use to address that. So um, for example, um, public financing for campaigns um, yeah. is really important or matching programs. There's some really interesting experiments on the West Coast where people get vouchers and they can contribute vouchers to the candidate of their choice. Wow. Um, so this okay. is a way of leveling the pay playing field for how people can contribute um, to campaign uh, donations and the like. So yes, so in our report, in mm -hmm. addition to the uh, constitutional amendment, which focuses on companies and corporations, um, there are some other recommendations which are about um, you know, supporting people's participation in politics through public financing of campaign matching programs and things like that. Okay, so before we uh, move into some of the questions from the audience, so we're, we're saying that um, individuals have a master means, and there's a way to bridge that gap between those who don't have the means. So we're not necessarily looking at placing a cap on an individual's ability to give. We're trying to true up the bottom of the base. That's that's right. I mean, honestly, there are caps all over the country. I mean, so states have caps of all kinds. They range. So yeah. Alaska, you know, has one of the tightest caps. Virginia <laughs> and Pennsylvania have no caps. This is for state giving. Federal giving is different. I personally like the British model. In the no. British model, they don't cap what you can give. Um, they cap the time period during which candidates can raise money. So oh. they say like from X date prior to the election to the election, that's the period in which you can raise money. 
Um, I think that's very productive, actually, to put a limit on the time being spent yeah. on fundraising rather than to put a limit on, you know, well, I, I actually am in favor of limits as well on contributions. But I think the, the key thing is to start actually paying attention to the, the time periods of investment on fundraising. Okay. All right. So you'll see me swivel a little bit. It's not time for uh, okay. to take questions from the audience, but uh, Joan um, had a question. She's a Presbyterian uh, minister and uh, reformed theologian, and is how she describes herself. But you know, the Declaration of Independence can be viewed by some as secular religion, and of course, the separation of church and state is something we look at. Uh, but you mentioned the basic uh, classical era contribution to the, the framers and what they produce. And it's kind of stoic, you know, stoicism is, mm. is one piece. It was like, you know, John Locke, um, the Leviathan, they were framing something for us to step within and then be passionate about. So how do we address religion, but government and also power? So I always like to say the declaration has two compromises in it. Uh, one's a good compromise and one's a bad compromise. The good compromise <laughs> is the compromise about religion in the declaration and then the bad yeah. compromise is the one about enslavement. But just to spend a minute on the good compromise around religion, yes. mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing that's amazing about the declaration is um, you know, it is a sort of secular faith document, but it's a faith document too. It's, it's both things simultaneously. And they were just incredibly imaginative and creative in their approach to articulating the moral basis for their effort. So for example, um, they talked at the very beginning about how what they were doing was really thinking about in, in their vocabulary, the laws of nature and nature is God. And wow. this is kind of a belt and suspenders phrase, right? So if you are a person of faith, you might anchor on the concept of nature is God, but if you were a, a deist like Jefferson or there were atheists also participating at the time, you would anchor on the idea of laws of nature. You don't necessarily need the concept of God to understand the idea that there are some basic principles that yes. support human flourishing. And the same is true with the other ways in which a concept of the divine comes into the declaration. So Jefferson did not put creator or divine providence or supreme judge in the declaration. A uh, creator came in through the influence of Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Okay. And then Supreme Judge and Divine Providence came in through the influence of Congress when Congress revised the document. So the, the, in other words, again, this is multiple voices coming together. But the important thing about this vocabulary for talking about a divinity in the declaration is, you know, first of all, that it, there was also this other way for folks who weren't necessarily people of faith to, to anchor the moral commitment. And then those words, creator, Supreme Judge, <clears throat> Divine Providence, they don't actually line up with any particular faith tradition. <coughs> Excuse mm. me. You know, they're That's not awesome. specific uh, to a specific doctrine or specific uh, faith uh, tradition again. So the point is that uh, people of multiple faiths could see their values in the document. So too could people who were committed to secular humanism, for example. Mm. Uh, um, and so that's what I mean by it's a compromise where every sort of possible position around religion that was then, you know, operative in the colonies um, had its way of being expressed in the document. So you could actually sign on to it and accept its moral yeah. basis from a lot of different starting points. That's a great example of compromise, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. So that does address um, the limits and, and the opportunity. Now, how important is it for us to, and this comes from Stephanie, how, how important is it for us to understand the intent? You know, you talked about um, the anti-slavement opportunity in the declaration. Uh, we, you know, the, the issue with gender and Abigail Adams and this committee of individuals coming from different places, right? To frame this instrument for us to use. Mm -hmm. um, so how important is it for us to understand the intent in our modern democracy? This is coming from Stephanie. Sure. So this is really one of the points I was trying to make about the declaration. You know, that, that second sentence is all important and it really captures uh. the foundation of principle that they were using to name the work ahead of them and ahead of all the generations that would follow them. And when you pay close attention to it, 
you'll see that um, what they say is that they expect the people always to judge for themselves. Mm. So their intent was that we should judge for ourselves. Ah. <laughs> okay, so that's the important thing. Yes, we, you, know, you should understand that we should understand their intent in the same way that you always want to understand the intent of any speaker. It's a human, right. that's the decent human thing to do. We should all be right. charitable listeners, charitable readers who seek to understand the intent of the speaker and seek to put ourselves in their position. But then as it happens, what it means to understand the intent of the framers is to see that their intention was for us to judge. Ah. Okay. So to understand their intent is not to be limited by yeah. a set of views about how things should be designed in 1787. It's to understand that they wanted us to judge how do you organize the powers of government to secure rights? That's the core work. They did it in 1776 through 83 as they wrote the Articles of Confederation. They redid it in 1787. They included an amendments process because they knew we were going to have to keep redoing it because that is ah, what it means mm -hmm. to charge people with the responsibility of judgment. Right. And so we have a responsibility to review where we are. And then as an individual, yep. as a part of a household or community or society, you know, yep. my, you know micro to macro, you, you need to take a look and take stock of what's working and what's not working and then take action. Exactly. So, I, I, do, again, I do like that. Mm -hmm. Let me just let me just say this part out loud again mm -hmm. as well. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are mm. life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Right. So that means it's a bigger set, among yes. which are among these which, things. yes. Right. So these are just some examples. That whole phrase, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is an invitation to us yes. to think for ourselves about rights and about how we are going to characterize fundamental rights. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, yes, but what else do we need to say about basic rights? There's more to be said. Right. And that does speak to the, the issue of power. You mentioned the uh, Lord Acton phrase about uh, power tends to corrupt, absolute yeah. power corrupts absolutely. But mm -hmm. it, that phrase also ends with the piece yep. that, you know, good men tend to be bad men. And so that, you know, anticipation that something may unravel means that we need to look for those trends, right? Mm -hmm. We need to look for that opportunity to um, bring something back into the fold that's not working. Um, yep. And this, this leads to a question that comes from Mary Ellen uh, from the Miami Herald. <clears throat> she's basically basically asking us to, of course, journalistically, uh, in looking at the influence on our democracy from social media, like Facebook and Twitter and what have you, um, you know, do we see a problem there? Is, there, is this a trend? Is it, is it self-correcting? What's going on there? All righty. Mm, <laughs> this a big is an one. important yeah. one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a deep one. So, all right, this, it could not be more important. All right. We are experiencing real problems, again, of division and factionalism. I started there in my remarks. And mm -hmm. we're not alone in that. We have had that experience at other points in our history. And even in the very, very beginning, they were concerned about being riven by faction. And that was the word of the 18th century. The concern was faction. We talk about polarization. They talked about faction. Uh -huh. And as they sought to design the Constitution, one of their foremost goals was to design a system that would minimize the force of faction, keep it to the lowest possible extent. They recognized that freedom meant people would come up with a whole lot of different things they thought uh -huh. and even some cockamamie right. things. So you would always have, you know, crazy stuff happening and yes. so forth, but you wanted to avoid it turning into faction and politics. And so in the Federalist Papers, James Madison, in, in the 10th essay, Federalist 10, explains why it is they think the design of what they've created is going to address the problem of factionalism, keep it under control. And there are two parts to the design that were supposed to be the solution, okay? okay. And when we think about this essay, when people teach it and read it, we often focus only on one part of the solution. The part we usually focus on is the concept of representation. 
the idea was that it was a representative democracy. And so our representatives right. would filter opinions and they would moderate and they would synthesize and they would come to some sort of common ground. Representation, the idea was, would help tamp down faction. But the second part of the solution that Madison names in that essay was actually geographic dispersal, okay? Oh. The idea was that it was a big country, people would be spread out, broken up by mountains and rivers and the like. People with extreme views wouldn't find each other. They oh. would have to go through representatives to get their views into the public sphere. Oh. So geography was a forcing factor, making representation work to do this job of filtering and synthesizing <laughs> and moderating. So you can see where I'm going. Right. Social media, when it was invented in 2005 with the arrival of Facebook, just knocked that pillar yes. out from under us. It totally removed the idea that geography was a forcing factor that would make representatives the right. vehicle through which <laughs> things would get moderated, mediated, and synthesized. So in fact, we have a deep and profound problem to rethink the operations of representation and to restore our capacity to filter and mediate and moderate and synthesize again. So yes, we face actually a very significant challenge because of the arrival right. of social media. All right, so we're, we're, we're nearing the, the end of this wonderful discussion, but uh, there's another issue that has been addressed state levels um, and you know, the right to marry, marriage equality. Um, and we had a lot of heterosexual men, white men, um, framing the constitution. And they looked at uh, power as masculine, as you mentioned, uh, and it's very linear. And do we have an opportunity or have you identified a pathway to be more inclusive? Or are we ignoring a, a population here? Well, you know, I think this is a place where Supreme Court jurisprudence, that is to say the decisions that the Supreme Court hands down, have been a very powerful ongoing conversation about those founding principles. And I would encourage everybody to read Justice Kennedy's decision um, in the marriage equality case um, because in Obergefell and Hodges, because um, it's a really very beautiful articulation of why the principle of equality and equal access to the legal institution of marriage um, really does apply to everybody. So I think yeah. it, that's a, it's a good example of that Supreme Court decision for how those original principles um, are thought through again in the new context as new questions emerge. There is still a continuity with the original ideas, but it's a recognition that in new contexts you also have some new discoveries to make. Amazing, amazing. That's a very good point, good reference piece. All right, well, I wanted to give you an opportunity to have uh, some closing remarks. We have a couple of minutes left and this has been delightful. And there are a lot of things we could continue to talk about, equality, and equity, you know, uh, that delineation. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I want you to have the opportunity to share something about something that's coming up with you, uh, your forthcoming book. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Magister. There you go. You're prompting yeah. me. Uh, so no, thank you. So I, I do have a book coming out um, in December called Democracy in the Time of Coronavirus. Very important. And the book comes out of a whole slew of COVID response work that I did uh, throughout 2020. And the core of it, so connected to our conversation here, um, one of the chapters focuses on this issue of federalism and how we could restore the idea that harmonization is the goal of our federal system. And I, I really try to dig into the question of what it would take to get back to a place um, where both we aspire to harmonize um, uh, and where we know how to harmonize. So I would love to have folks take a look and would love feedback um, on the yeah. arguments. So uh, well, you can find me on the website at Harvard and send me your thoughts. I would welcome that. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it. You've been delightful, engaging, and uh, actually I was uh, impressed by how nimble you were in some of these dynamic issues that face us. And uh, I really respect the work that you're doing and I appreciate your availability tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. What wonderful conversation. Thank you for the great questions, everybody. Really terrific to be with you all. All right. Thank you. So on behalf of Florida Humanities, the Village Square and our streaming partners, 
we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you come back on November 4th for the third in our Democracy Reignited series, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth with author and public intellectual Jonathan Roche. You'll receive a follow-up email with a registration link later this evening for the event. Good night, everyone.